Welcome back to our session seven, day four of our Ending Age-Related Disease Conference. And uh, the topic for today is, of course, biotech investment. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's Fiona Miller from Quadroscope. So she's the managing partner at Quadroscope Venture Fund. Prior to joining the longevity investment community, her focus was on wireless technologies, initially working as an electronics design engineer and R&D manager before going off on her own to launch new technology ventures. She was founder and CEO of Octoscope, sold to Spiring Communications in 2021, the founder and CTO of Azimuth Systems, sold to Anritsu in 2016, and VP of Engineering at Scope Communications, which was later sold to Hewlett Packard, now Keysight, in 1998. She holds multiple patents. And with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Fiona Miller. Yes, um, thank you, Oliver. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, so in this session, uh, we will review key trends in the rejuvenation medicine market, and we will look at some market segmentation. Quadroscope is a new fund. We're based in Boston and Tel Aviv, uh, two leading life sciences hubs. And um, like many other funds and investors at this conference, we invest into companies that aim to reverse aging. We are a well-rounded team. You already heard about me. We're an entrepreneur, a fund manager, and a scientist. So my partner Miri most recently ran a venture fund in Israel. She's based in Israel and has spent her career in financial management and executive roles in the healthcare center. But she will be speaking on a panel this afternoon. Jose is an MD and a PhD from McGill, focusing on the mechanism of aging. And as part of our investment strategy, we have gathered some market data that we will share in the session. Jose is responsible for creating and analyzing the charts and data presented here. So with that, let's dive in. So here's where we are in our industry cycle. We're going to skip the snake oil phase, other than to say that it hasn't been helpful in advancing the real science. Last year, uh, saw a surge of investments into research labs, pharmaceutical ventures, and longevity clinics. And we expect increasing deployment of rejuvenation treatments in the next few years. Some of the more effective treatments, such as stem cells, are initially being done offshore due to regulatory barriers barriers that will unfortunately be the last to fall. Let's start with the science. Right here at the ending age-related disease issue of 2022, we heard from remarkable scientists, rejuvenation pioneers like Michael West, Greg Fay, and George Church, leading scientists like Steve Horvath, Vadim Gladyshev, and Irina Convoy. Influencers like Brad Stanfield and, and NIA's Ron Kohansky. These scientists and this community has the power to change the world, to end diseases, and to change medicine as we know it. So my question is, can you guys, can this community help me achieve my personal dream of going back to looking and feeling like I did at the peak of my youth? When will we have the science and technology to do this? Can we create a new cycle of life, an infinite loop? To fully appreciate the scientific achievements of the past two decades, let us look at the Nobel Prizes awarded for rejuvenation-related discoveries. Organ development and program cell death in 2002, telomeres in 2009, cellular reprogramming in 2012, DNA repair, autophagy, gene editing. This slide, by the way, has links that you can click for further information. Several of these scientists are now engaged with rejuvenation companies whose logos are shown here. Altus Labs alone has two Nobel laureates and many of the best minds in, the, in our industry. So the science is happening. The number of rejuvenation related publications is increasing exponentially and the number of relevant clinical trials is steadily rising year over year. Last year saw a surge of funding for rejuvenation-focused ventures. The most 
notable, we all know, is Alto Slabs, funded by Yuri Milner and Jeff Bezos to the tune of $3 billion. Calico, one of the first rejuvenation ventures, initially funded back in 2013 by Larry Page, has received an additional billion. Cambrian, uh, notable investments shown here, altogether, uh, total nearly $6 billion invested. A major surge just last year. Uh, you can click on each point in the plot to link to the information on that particular investment. And here's some investment data from PitchBook. The number of longevity companies launched each year is steadily growing, and the investment dollars are rising. Uh, if you are uh, carefully look at the numbers, uh, their investment dollar figure for 2021 is approaching $4 billion, uh, and it is below what we have uh, come up with. Uh, but Jose has documented every data point on the plot in the previous slide. So we stand by our numbers. Our numbers are nearly six billion um, in 2021. Very little funding is coming from our government, which continues to spend its R&D dollars, our tax dollars on the treatment of individual diseases. And even the $5 billion spent on aging in 2021 is mostly allocated to Alzheimer's and brain disease research and not to addressing the fundamental mechanism of aging. But aging is the root cause of most of the diseases. And instead of spending nearly half a trillion dollars a year on treating the diseases of aging after they happen, this community understands we should be spending the money on rejuvenation to prevent these diseases from happening in the first place. This chart shows our total market, including all the markets shown in the previous slide. So we took all of these diseases, treatment of diseases, they're all in here, but we've added categories like cosmeceuticals, alternative medicine, etc. Most of the spending could be directed to rejuvenation. So rejuvenating our bodies so we get genuinely young and healthy, not cosmetically, but from within. We have here a trillion dollar annual global market. That rejuvenation medicine could displace and penetrate in the next 10 to 20 years. Many of you already know that rejuvenation drugs address the same pharmaceutical markets as conventional drugs disease treatment and disease prevention. But they do so via tackling the underlying mechanisms of aging. And this gives them a huge advantage, a vast additional market of aging people who have not yet developed the disease. Everyone over 40 years of age is a customer. And the longer they live, the longer they remain a customer. The future of medicine is rejuvenation. Okay, so here is a view of the industry segmentation. We arrange it by conditions that we can treat. We're not showing an exhaustive list of companies in each category, but only a few representative companies. The links to each company's website are embedded in the logos. And by the way, these slides will be on our website, so you can visit and click on each logo to learn more. Here you see categories such as mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, immune system dysfunction, etc. Quadroscope's investments are outlined in red. This segmentation doesn't give justice to the power of rejuvenation drugs that typically treat multiple conditions simultaneously. Take, for example, mitochondrial rejuvenation. Tom Benson, CEO of Mitrix, one of our portfolio companies, is working on full body mitochondria replacement. Tom presented on day one of the show. He believes that if we can rejuvenate aging mitochondria, we can address most hallmarks of aging. He may well be right. Another way to look at the market is through the lens of how common modalities of treatment address the hallmarks of aging. You see here a matrix with the hallmarks shown horizontally and the treatment modalities vertically. The size of the circles indicates therapeutic potential. You can see that cellular reprogramming, the last row, works across many mechanisms of aging, 
No surprise here. That's why billions of dollars were invested last year into cellular reprogramming ventures, including Altos Labs. Cell therapy is another powerful modality that can reverse stem cell exhaustion. Stem cells have the potential to fix a lot of what breaks down in our bodies over the years. As you can see, there are different ways of analyzing and visualizing the rejuvenation market, and we welcome your ideas. Of course, we need to measure the effectiveness of the emerging rejuvenation treatments. And the common process is periodically to collect and examine various biomarkers and then adjust the treatment modalities and dosages in the feedback loop. Biomarkers include aging clocks, blood work, imaging, and more. Um, I am now on month 17 of the TRIMEX trial. And throughout this trial, uh, this feedback loop has been carefully managed by Dr. Greg Fain, who reported on TRIMEX project at the show on Thursday. Uh, by the way, Trimex is working amazingly well for me. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going back to the Lundquist Institute for my final Trimex test. Here's the market segmentation of the aging biomarkers. This is a big industry unto itself. We, we have here molecular biomarkers, for example, methylation clocks, biochemical biomarkers to measure inflammatory proteins in the blood, for example, glucose, CRP, clotho, et cetera. Functional biomarkers such as cognitive tests and other types of biomarkers. Again, follow the links on the logos to learn more. So to end where we began, the science is advancing at a remarkable pace. The investments are surging and the deployment of treatments, some of them into offshore clinics is starting to happen. The last remaining barrier is regulatory. And we're lucky to have this powerful group of scientists working with the FDA to chip away at this barrier. The time is off the essence for many of us, but step by step, we will clear the way to healthy lifespans. Thank you for attending. We welcome your questions and suggestions. Thank you very much, Fiona. <clears throat> so I'm gonna check my feed here for some questions that are gonna be coming through. Uh, so you spoke, um, so uh, yeah, got compliments <laughs> from, from folks saying that was a, that was a great, uh, that was a great uh, deck of slides you have there. There's a lot of information that I'm sure people are gonna go through and take a look at. Um, so you noted on the hallmarks of aging slide that you had there that people are, um, you know, one of the kind of, most a lot of the focus is going into um, uh, into cellular reprogramming because it's going across the board and hitting a lot of a lot of targets. Um, are there any examples of cellular reprogramming companies that you find particularly exciting that are kind of the most furthest along the line, I guess, to potential therapeutics um, getting past? or close to getting past the regulatory barriers and you know, getting translated into, into a potential medical usage. Yeah, my understanding is a lot of progress is being made. Uh, I think it's still considered risky uh, due to the stability. I guess we've seen some experiments from David Sinclair's lab of two twin mice, mm -hmm. and one of them was older, but Alas, they went the opposite way. <laughs> they took a young mouse and they made it older. And so we know where the genes are. Obviously, we know something about it. But going from old to young, uh, you know, we're still worried about teratoma and instability. So mm -hmm. I think this treatment is not ready for deployments for some time to come. I don't know which company is closest. We still have some work to do in that area. What about in some of the in some of the other areas? Or is there is there something uh, from from all the companies that you're investing in and in, in the slide deck that you showed that's furthest along in in that in uh, in, in the direction of getting past regulatory hurdles, getting into um, later stage clinical trials, and and seeing it trickle into you know usage in the clinic and in hospitals. Yes, yeah, several things actually. Uh, I mentioned already Trimex, uh, right, Greg right. intervened me. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just amazed how much it did for me. I developed new muscle tone. I lost weight, and the muscle tone motivated me to go start working out. 
And on my 12 month test, I, I was 67% stronger. I showed that much improvement and I am 61. Now people my age don't build muscles like that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, my skin got better. Um, so that's one that's here today. Uh, I, I have yet to see the final results, but I know how I feel. Uh, so the other thing we see is obviously rapamycin. Um, mm -hmm. and just a lot of uh, evidence that it's mm -hmm. working. Um, peptides. Mm -hmm. And as a as a reminder to folks, because Greg Fay actually you know spoke earlier in our in our earlier sessions, um, that you're referring to the trim tri are you referring to the uh, the Trimex trial, which is DHEA and uh, metformin is, and that, growth hormone and growth hormone. Okay, this is the trim trial. Yes, that's the one. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a question coming in from Keith. Keith, you have a question. Uh. Yeah, first I just wanted to say uh, I thought this was a great talk, uh, Fanny. I thought those visualizations were were super clear, and it leads me to like a, a follow up question. One of the things that I'd love to see that your visualizations seem to tee up is based on kind of those breakdowns. Have Jose or whoever made that, or anyone in your circle, been looking at how to compare a graph like that with? you know, um, what the results would be, you know, if we were to cure cancer completely, what's the economic value? If we were to cure dementia completely, what's the economic value? Because I think if you were to juxtapose those two kinds of graphs, that could be a powerful thing to like show people in the government and say, listen, we're not prioritizing things properly. Yeah, no, that's a great yeah. idea. And um, I'm sure Jose is eager to do more on that. Yeah, and we'll we'll get in touch with you, Keith, and coordinate. It's, okay, it's great. very good with this visualization. We like to... Uh, get some ideas like that on what yeah. to work on. No, I, I really like your visualization. So that was more of a comment and a question. <laughs> I'll go back into the shadows. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so besides, so obviously you're excited about, uh, you know, uh, Greg's work uh, because you're not only, uh, not only um, well excited about the science, but you're actually participating in, in it. Um, so that's really super encouraging and exciting to hear that somebody's actually you know so encouraged by the science that they're they're a, 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 not only an investor but a participant as well um is there anything else that is exciting you to that extent other than other than the the trim and trim x trials um where you would be like wow like not only do i want to invest in this not only do i think the science is solid but maybe i'm going to participate in this or do you think greg's work is the most furthest along that you feel comfortable jumping into that. Yeah, well, uh, another company we really like is Immunis. Uh, so they have stem cells based uh, secretome type treatment. I don't know how much I'm supposed to say, uh, but very powerful against stem cell based uh, may potentially impact multiple hallmarks of aging. And I would say just as a biohacker, um, uh, as soon as I finish the Trimex trial, I can't do anything else now because I'm on this trial and I'm, I'm not supposed to be doing anything else. But in a couple of weeks after my final test, I'm going to start doing everything, you know, from hyperbaric chambers to Covenson peptides to rapamycin. And then my challenge will be, you know, we're, I'm not going to know what's doing what. And the community of biohackers is still trying to figure out how, what are the metrics? We don't have that clean loop for, you know, when you start changing so many variables. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mentioned that because I know, I know of some people that are already excited by uh, Irina Convoy's work. She was a, she was a speaker um, earlier, I believe it was a yesterday's session. And she, we've covered a lot of her papers in our, in our um, scientific journal clubs. And, uh, and I know people are already participating in, in, um, uh, in the uh, uh, plasma transfer, um, the the isotonic transfer of the dilution of plasma, and 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 clearing negative bloodborne factors um, by 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 the transfer of isotonic solutions that have albumin. Um, so, I'm really encouraged to see a lot of a lot of um, uh, therapies and potential therapies that are you know I refer to them as low hanging fruit because they are you know they're have a very high good safety profile and and a pretty pretty good risk to reward ratio. Um, so a lot of that is 
trickling in that, uh, you know, I haven't seen in the past, uh, you know, 15 years ago, for example. So hopefully we'll see more kind of um, more radical approaches such as such as rejuvenatory approaches to, regarding, you know, with regards to cellular reprogramming, um, you know, entering, entering into uh, uh, maybe, not, maybe not common usage, but certainly entering into clinical usage. But so, yes, therapeutic plasma exchange, I completely agree. It's safe, it's available, and it seems very promising. So big bang for the buck. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Um, so that talk was um, really super enlightening, and there was a lot of information in the slides that people can jump off of and um, really go into a deep dive.